Mei! You see, no, I will. Welcome to Shoujo and Tell, where we discuss shoujo manga and tell who's hot and who's not, talk about themes, and just generally geek out. Today, October 10th, 2020, will be Shoujo and Telling about the second half of After School Nightmare by Setona Mizushiro. So that's volumes 6 through 10. I'm your host, Ashley McDonald, and I'm joined by Muna Tore. Hello, Muna. Hello. Nice to, nice to talk with you again. Oh, yes. I mean... Man, we're getting, it's just so many things happen, Moon. <laughs> so much. Oh my god, so much. I can see why you wanted, yeah, to split this into two, even though I was like, 10 is usually I do one episode, and you were like, no, trust me. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't want that, and you were right. <laughs> um, yeah, this series, like, you need some breaks, and you need, like, some time for it to marinate so you could think about it. Um, yeah because a lot. a lot happens there's a lot to think about yeah just from chapter to chapter you're like wait what is going on all right <laughs> fine <laughs> I'm sure weird. but that's kind of why I love it <laughs> yeah yeah well Muna, just in case somebody is like I don't care what people have to say about the first five volumes where they know nothing <laughs> about after school nightmare and they only listen to this podcast who who are you <laughs> oh yes Hello, my name is Muna Ture. Um, I am a, well, my pronouns are she, her. I am a Black cartoonist and zinster. I make a lot of work that's very influenced by shoujo and otome. Yeah, I make comics. I also do some music stuff. I play harmonica and I write English fan dub lyrics, basically. Whoa, you play harmonica. That's like yeah. those things that everybody's like, wait a minute, what? Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. It's just consisting of me playing harmonica and learning and sort of making up covers of my favorite anime songs. <laughs> uh, this is the best thing I've heard in a while. So I love it. <laughs> Thank you for this joy. <laughs> okay. Welcome. But yes, we are going to talk about a second half of a series that has a lot of twists. So if you have not read After School Nightmare, perhaps you don't want to listen to this because there are going to be so many spoilers. It's going to be spoilerific. You might want to try to read ahead if you can, like read what you can ahead of time. (laughs) Yeah. Unfortunately, the series is out of print, Mm -hmm. but it was fairly easy to find on ebay and i don't necessarily condone this but i'm sure you can find scanlations or whatever probably unfortunately rip or you can um petition some publishers via their preferred methods of communication to buy the license (laughs) again you're right someone could possibly license rescue this like yeah. Quite a few series have gotten licensed rescued like Fruits Basket. Yeah, so we could do that. Yeah, this was an Eisner. Was it an Eisner that it got nominated for? I think, uh, it, I think After School Nightmare won an award in the States for Best YA Series. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, like Mizu, Mizu, Mizushiro, almost said Mizuhashi. That's a different thing. <laughs> Mizushiro. That's name. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's that's a character, Ashley. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Don't get all the water people confused. Anyway, <laughs> Mizushiro was nominated for an Eisner. Yeah, for, I don't remember what it was for, but she definitely was. Um, so like Mizushiro, a big deal. After School Nightmare. Yeah, a lot she's of also things. making some current stuff these days, too. Like, she's more venturing into BL stuff these days, I think. Well, who could have guessed? Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, like, her style really lends itself to that. Like, I actually don't see a lot of overlap between artists who make both shoujo and BL, and I wish there was more overlap. Because the creator of, like, what is it, Kiss Him Not Me did both. As you, as one could probably tell from the story. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. I've always been like, oh, all these things are distinct. I'm like, well, yeah, why does BL have to necessarily not be shoujo? You know what? I'm not going to get into that right now. Yeah. That could be a topic for another podcast. That's a, that's a whole podcast on to itself. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, okay, now that we've given... Spoiler warning, for real. We're going to spoil all the things from here on out. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Muna, do you want to give a very quick walkthrough of like the very big points that happen to jog anybody's memory who they have read it maybe but not in a while yeah so with volumes one through five some of the places we left off with was uh, our protagonist Mashiro he was obsessed with uh, the identity of the knight in these in these dreams and the little girl in the dreams I told told him that uh, that the night was so uh the love interest slash rival question mark question mark question mark yes because <laughs> i can't call him an antagonist he's not really that either but no. maybe a foil perhaps yeah and i believe volume six no sorry volume five ended with with characters like kurosaki senpai who was the captain of the kendo club and Mashida really, really admired his masculinity and wanted to be more like him. And in addition, uh, there was a character who was not seen at the time, uh, just sort of silhouetted or the panel kind of cut off at her, at, at her knees so you couldn't see who was talking to the teacher of the, of the uh, after school t- classes saying, I can't come back to this class, I'm going to quit. And that's where volume five left us at. Um, yeah, and then in, in these volumes, uh, we find out so many things. <laughs> yeah, we, ooh, we find out so much. It's, it's a wild ride. First of all, I would like to say that I knew not to trust I, but <laughs> I didn't know how deeply to not trust that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was crazy. Exactly. <laughs> and... Uh, for those who might be jumping into this podcast, um, first of all, you're very brave. I don't know why you're doing this um, <laughs> without hearing about the first five. But this is a reread for me because when I first read this, I was in high school. So I only remember bits and pieces and only kind of how it ended. Like, oh, yeah, I remember what the protagonist looked like on like the last five pages. Okay. And now, in the year of our Lord 2020, and I'm 27 now, um, reading this again, it's like, oh my god, this was more messed up than I remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely wondered um, reading it again. Well, well, we'll get into that later. But yeah, so the yeah. big things that happen in volume six are like... Um, or in, in volume six through ten, are like we find out that so was indeed not the night, yeah, as I had told him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what's his Kaz- Kazu? Why can't I remember his name right now? <laughs> oh, Kurosaki? Uh, K- Kurosaki, yeah, yeah, Duh, like Kurosaki Ichigo, actually. Duh, come on, wrong <laughs> <laughs> genre. <laughs> but it's so helpful to remember. <laughs> uh, I've been rewatching Bleach. Yeah. So oh my like, god. Oh, yeah, it's Kurosaki Ichigo. You know, Kuchiki. It's always been a uh, Kuchiki Biakuya and Kurosaki Ichigo is where I'm at right now. I'm like, you guys oh, gotta yeah, stop yeah. full full naming each other right now. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> the would be shonen of shonen, Byakuya Kuchiki. Anyway. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh god, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Absolutely, but but yes, Kurosaki was the <laughs> the knight yeah, all along. Yeah, that he was the knight, and what was something I found really interesting about that is how they reveal it. Like the knight was talking, and then he mentioned like, if only my father didn't X Y Z, and I'm like, wait a goddamn minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> so doesn't talk about his daddy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's so like, oh, here's a reveal. Well, there are so many things about this. But yes, then we find out. The, okay. 
So yeah, so sewing kureha also become like a thing for a hot second. I was like, lol, of course. <laughs> yeah, because there's a point where kureha does break up with Mashiro because she felt like Mashiro was pitying her. Like, oh, we're only together to make you feel better about yourself. I mean, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> like... Yeah. And all throughout that time, I thought... Wait, is Kureha a beard? Like, I, I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with the term beard in like. I am not. Okay, I will explain what a beard is. I'm um, so uncool these days. Yeah. <laughs> like this is this is kind of a form of queer slang. So when a woman is referred to as a beard, it is a situation where a man who might be closeted. Mm. is dating a woman to uphold his masculinity yeah okay like oh yeah i'm definitely a masculine manly man because i have a girlfriend that's what they <laughs> mean by a beard and so could i have felt like are you just using me for that are you using me to make you feel better about yourself in that case we're done yeah and then she started hanging out with so yeah, <laughs> i was, was like of course. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting to see them become friends because they ended up like talking to each other about Mashiro. Like even one of the panels said like club meeting of what like it was just a little aside, but it said like club meeting of victims of of Mash- Mashiro Ichijo. And the first <laughs> thing that came to mind was a scene in Mean Girls. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there anyone has not seen the 2004 movie Mean Girls, which you might be living under a rock, and that's saying a lot coming from me. There's a scene where a teacher says, like, raise your hand if you've been personally victimized by Regina George, and everybody raises their hand. Um, (laughs) So that's what immediately reminded me of, like, raise your hand if you've been personally victimized by Mashiro Ichijo. Me. But it's only those two. Well, no. So I was like, it's only those two. But I was like, no, we we could throw Kurosaki in there, I guess. I think so. <laughs> Kurosaki's kind of a weird case in this regard. Because <laughs> his whole thing is that he's hiding who he really wants to be. And he's just upholding this really perfect kind of guy as a person as a persona like oh everybody admires me everybody thinks I'm I'm wonderful and an upstanding member of society and he's only keeping that up as an act because of how his parents want him to be specifically his father I have to admit that I was like I was not prepared to be focused on Kurosaki in this like like you know we get lots of characters Mm -hmm. that we focus on for a short period of time uh, outside of our main three or four, right? Like uh, Mm -hmm. if if we're including So's sister, which we're getting to. But yeah, yeah, so I was like, well, yeah, this this manga only cares about uh, Kureha, uh, So, uh, Mashiro, and I. And so Mm -hmm. I I was really uh, like thrown off that suddenly we were like cared about Kurosaki for like multiple volumes. And I was like, I don't feel like I care about this boy enough to like, <laughs> <laughs> be this invested in his uh, oh my god my my dad wants me to uh, yeah you know be a snobby rich boy and take over his company and I just like don't want to story I was like I don't yeah they spent an interesting amount of time on him because they even like went into like the point of view not even the point of view like Kurosaki's uh conversations with his chauffeur uh, his chauffeur driver I thought that was interesting like these monologues he's having with his chauffeur talking back to him every now and then <laughs> his very reasonable chauffeur yeah <laughs> yep. like wow you're acting as a therapist basically <laughs> yeah yeah chauffeur chauffeur slash therapist yeah mm-hmm. uh yeah I don't know I guess to me it's like Okay, it's uh I guess we have to focus on him because he ends up being the knight, but I'm like, 
Uh, the only interesting part of this to me uh, was the extended discussions they then had about, uh, you know, trying to tell illusion from reality. Like, uh, oh, I yeah. thought it was really, really interesting how So was like, oh, yeah, well, I purpose like they both like Kurosaki and So both played Mashiro uh, independent of like they, they, like they didn't talk about it to each other. Right. Like it wasn't a, a grand scheme plan. Like right. they both were just like, OK, um, well, Kurosaki in Kurosaki's case, he's like, it just kind of made me mad and was kind of more convenient for you to think that it was so because then you're always mad at him instead of me. <laughs> and so it was like it, it was just more convenient to have you think, uh, yeah, that it was me. So I just let that happen. <laughs> yeah. They didn't discuss this with each other at all. They're just like, wow, you're easy to play. Might as well do it. Yeah. Uh, and so then they have extended discussions about like, uh, th- you know, this was your dream. Like you already thought that you knew what the reality was. But then, of course, it's like, uh, well, well, by by assuming that reality, like, uh, you know, it kind of became that for a while. <laughs> like that was his is the actual reality of, of the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for Mashiro. And so then it's just like, oh yeah, other people's dreams can reflect, like they can just live in their own realities, right? Like I think it's actually a very powerful statement about living in your own reality and how like everybody's reality is true, right? Yeah. Even if they don't line up, uh, which I think is actually a very powerful thing that perhaps we need to learn in this current 2020 timeline. <laughs> Sometimes mm, I'm like, it's a very good lesson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure we can get, I think we can get more into the dream illusion thing too uh, with yeah. the next twist, which was, um, actually, I'm a little unclear. Okay, so <laughs> the, the eye that we know was actually an illusion yeah. of so. <laughs> oh my God, the, the way that that was brought in. Okay, at one point, uh, I think it was in volume seven, Mashiro over here is that I, the um, so's, uh, so's sister goes to a different school, and Mashiro yeah. thinks, "Oh, that's weird." So yeah. she's not a student here. What's up with that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So then, I'm I'm just wondering. I have I have so many questions about this. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, I guess we have to mention also that the ultimate twist of the manga is that really they are not in a school. They are beings, they are babies who have not been born yet, who are in gestation in the parents' bellies. And I think that's important. Yeah, I think that's important. And so this is all just a very, very elaborate uh, metaphor of what happens when you're in the womb, right? Uh, So... Something I, like that? Big shrug? Something, yeah, the shrug. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't hold up all the time, but you know, <laughs> so that's that's fine. But so I think that plays into I and the questions I have because, okay, we are told that actually there is a sister named I who like so and her parents divorced. Mm-hmm. So then I went with the dad and so stayed with their mom. Uh, And, you know, I had made all these promises being like, no, 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 no. So we're going to be together uh, all the time. It's okay. I'll always be there for you. Uh, I will take this teddy bear and it will be a stand-in for you. And then the first time he goes to visit her, uh, he sees her like drop the teddy bear in place of a dog. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Yeah. And she was wearing a white dress at that time. Right. Right. And it, I should note that I only just made the connection that so was a dog in the end in the dreams. We'll get back to that maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then, uh, so yeah, so then so is like, no, I, I has betrayed me, right? Uh, so I, so then he makes basically a version of I that is the exact opposite of, yeah, that girl that he saw uh, the last time that he went to her house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in this, but then we are also a black dress. Yes, she was wearing a black dress. <laughs> so he, uh, uh, yes, so she's just way more goth, I guess, is <laughs> basically what we yeah. learned. <laughs> Mitsushiro has a thing about gothic Lolita, by the way. 
Oh. Yeah, she was definitely rocking that look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because in her previous work, X Day, there was another character who wore a similar kind of dress, a gothic Lolita dress. So it made me wonder, like, I think she really likes this fashion. That's really I think cool. she's really into this <laughs> aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, okay, so we're told that actually, like, at some point, real eye dies. So I guess my biggest question is, there was a real eye, right? And she miscarried. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps. Okay. Like if you're keeping up with the um with the twist that was revealed at the end that uh in reality. Oh yeah. I guess that's also a twist. I didn't even like, <laughs> like Okay. I think the the eye in the who in the timeline that uh, that we originally knew of, um, the way they described it was like first she had a headache and then she just died. Right, but that yeah. somehow f- means that she was linked to like fake eye. In linked my opinion, what? she was linked to like the illusion eye that uh, So was dreaming. That that's yeah. what it implied to me. Okay. And so then I was like, but does that mean she was real or not? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not sure if we made very clear the whole thing about the eye that we knew of up until a certain point that so is convinced like, oh, she's right here all the time. Yeah. And he would look at these letters, uh, these notes that were left in his desk or, or given to him, and he would see these little messages from I. But in reality, they were all blank. <laughs> yeah. As soon as Kureha saw it, I was like, oh, man, it's not going to say anything. And I was right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, and So also thinks that he's like in a sexual relationship with fake I, who is not a physical being. <laughs> right. I just have so many questions. <laughs> And so, okay, I'll have to do another reread at some point. <laughs> yeah, can you? <laughs> because, like, with the case that um, that the eye that we knew was never really in existence, then all the scenes that we saw with eye, what yeah. were we looking at? <laughs> exactly. Was that all in Stoa's head? And I'm like, wait, maybe I just missed this, but was so in the dreams was he i <laughs> that's what i considered i okay. thought that same thing i i myself i'm sorry the name i in japanese it means love but when you say it in an english sentence yeah it's yeah like <laughs> okay we're getting confused <laughs> yeah oh God, that I'll is what you muna here. thought <laughs> <laughs> that, that might get confusing hopefully not but yeah but that's not made clear right like they don't explicitly say that (laughs) yeah there's even a scene where you see um like early earlier on somewhere in in volumes one through five you see i mizuhashi with a pair of binoculars looking over at so like being nosy and spying on him yeah and, and then it's like, whose perspective is that? Exactly. That's a very good question. <laughs> Me is just, just messing with our heads. Yeah. I have so many questions. <laughs> exactly. This is definitely a manga that would um, yeah, benefit from actually a very like rapid reread, right? Like you finish it and then you're like, damn it. I have to just start it over again mm-hmm. <laughs> to see uh, how this plays out. Yeah, I just, I think the biggest twist for me was not that, like, yeah, they were really babies in the womb or anything. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I have so many questions about So Sister. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I have the most questions about. For, like, oh, oh, God, another thing that I don't think, it was kind of a blinking, you'll miss it kind of thing, Mm. but... One of the students in the dream, I think it was Kureha, when she was about to fall into her dream, 
there was a different teacher talking to her. Oh. And, yeah, and up until that point, we'd only seen the one teacher who had the really curly hair and the mole on her cheek um, talking to Mashiro. Yeah. And I thought, wait, who's this other school nurse? Who is this? Oh. And I have a theory on that. Well, it was shown, right, that, like, yeah, Mashiro's nurse looked like his mom, right? So is it all their moms? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. That's exactly yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I it's... just didn't register, yeah, that Kuriha had seen some somebody else. Yeah, again, it was like a blinking you'll miss it kind of thing. Like, uh... if one were reading qu- uh, uh, maybe quickly enough, they might have glossed over that or might have missed it. Something I was trying to do really deliberately as I was reading uh, uh, reading this manga was try to spend a certain amount of time with my eyes lingering on every panel. Yeah. On one hand, this is like for ADHD reasons, but on the <laughs> other hand, it's for art appreciation reasons. Um, oh, yeah. Because like I majored in art and I took classes about art appreciation and how to think like an artist, et cetera, et cetera. And that being said, I had learned that the average person went in an art museum, like, regardless of an art education, if they look at a piece of art in a museum, they don't look at it for long. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We super, we super just are like, okay, there's a million uh, art pieces to see, right? So I have to spend five seconds with each one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or it comes from a place of, I don't get it, and walk away. Mm. But I bring that up to say... Nowadays, when I read comics, I try not to read it just for the words. Like, I always uh, read comics and manga for, like, the visuals as well. But sometimes when you're really immersed in a story, you just read the words and keep going at the words. When the images are just as important, usually. Because usually, depending on the story, it's supposed to immerse you in it. I can't say this for all of them, because for some manga... That's not necessarily the intention, but I still think it's important to at least look. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, especially After School Nightmare is so, like, there's actually a lot, a lot of symbolism in it that, like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm uh, missing tons of it. As we discussed last time, you were like, there's different flowers in different scenes. And yeah, if we knew more stuff about flowers, that'd probably be really significant to... Uh, different things and you know and then yeah they all manifest as you know different things in their dreams that obviously are supposed to uh, reflect something like uh, metaphor wise and and all these things and I'm just like goodness (laughs) you could write you could write a whole book yeah like analyzing after school nightmare (laughs) for sure. sure I hope someone wrote a thesis on this Oh my god, yeah. Some somebody out there surely has, right? <laughs> I mean people wrote theses on like Neon Genesis Evangelion and then Hideaki Anno said like, Oh yeah, I added those crosses because they look cool. They didn't really mean much. <laughs> I know. I'm like well, yeah, there's always a layer of like, okay, how much of it is intentional and how much of it is like it looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, exactly. <laughs> It's always a delicate balance, you know? (laughs) Sometimes it's like, okay, I know people have talked about, um, what's his name? Sigmund Freud. Like, oh, the baseball bat means something phallic. But sometimes it's like, sometimes the baseball bat is just a baseball bat. So it's like, where do you draw the line? Who knows? Who knows? You just have fun, everybody. Yep. And wonder. Have fun and wonder. Yeah. I guess what this is bringing up for me is that like, Again, I, I think that this is definitely needs a reread. But now I'm like, okay, yeah, knowing that this is a manga actually about them being babies in a womb, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, the the disabled like um, accident mermaid story actually resonates like way more. Even though again, it's it's very short. Like uh, she's only there yeah. for a couple chapters. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, it's actually even maybe even more powerful of a disability representation to be like, uh, oh, people normally consider at least aborting, right? Like uh, hmm. babies that develop complications. <laughs> uh, 
now that we have, especially all this testing. Maybe, maybe this manga is from 2005. I mean, our rapid advances in technology are very scary oh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, like, well, yeah, I'm sure you could do this, but mm-hmm. yeah. But I, I do think that we've made like rapid uh, advances in te- technology and uh, those things uh, become more affordable with as, as time right. goes on and, and stuff like that. So I'm just like, oh, oh yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> the thing that I had lost and now I remember again, um, at the very beginning of the series, uh, it was called back to in the in the very last volume. And it was basically that, like, what happened before, like, do you remember the very beginning of your life? <laughs> no. Like, what's the furthest memory that you have? And apparently, Mashiro didn't even exist until the events of the first volume. I mean, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes sense based on how none of them, like, like, they don't have a past, really. Like, they have past to their parents. But my theory about that is that it's like, um, you know, they say that babies can hear stuff in the womb. So we, like, play oh. the music and everything to um, yeah, make them you know smarter harder better faster stronger <laughs> babies <Yeah>. you know <laughs> um Wait, what about Kudaha then because she had a past of being sexually assaulted i know but i still feel like there's mostly like uh well this is why i have questions about it i'm like so why do they mm. have like weird pasts but yeah then they, they don't remember like critical things or like have friend networks before they go to the school right but i'm right. still just like i kind of feel like uh, yeah, what Kureha, like Kureha does get assaulted is what we're said, what we're told. Mm-hmm. But I feel like a lot of the emphasis was actually just more on how her dad said horrible things, right? And I was like, oh, okay, I could believe that that was like a thing that she hears, uh, you know, as a baby in a womb, right? Like that's that could be like a plausible metaphor thing that I could be fine with. <laughs> Yeah, but but otherwise, I'm like, I don't know what to make about all this sexy stuff in the <laughs> in the like weird random pasts that they have. Yeah, I'm like, what does this mean? <laughs> what does this mean? But like, it makes sense for Kurosaki too, right? Like, like what I'm saying of like they can hear stuff. Like, I could totally see, you know, a, a dad who's a big corporate overlord oh. be like, oh, my God. Yeah, I hope that you come out someday and you, like, take over for me and, like, blah, blah, exactly. blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, and the mom being like, oh, please, uh, yeah, I hope that you can, like, live up to your father's dreams <laughs> and all this stuff. Like, I'm like, that seemed totally uh, reasonable to me, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know that with Kurosaki, he went to his mother – being able to confide in her at first. At first. But when she uh, when she made it clear, like, I'm about to die. You do need to do what your father says. Yeah. So then does she die in real life? And need I think to have so. him cut out? Okay. Oh, this manga. You just asked yeah. so, many, so many questions. So many questions. Absolutely. At the very end. Well, in the last uh, volume, the, we, we do see the Black Moon. Yeah. And that is some heavy foreshadowing that Mashiro is about to graduate. And he unintentionally says a sentence or two in past tense, and that is picked up on by So. Like he said, why did you say that in past tense? And Mashiro couldn't pinpoint why. I was also confused because I was like, that thing didn't even happen yet, right? Like, Exactly. Yeah. But, oh, I wish I could have seen it. It's like, wait, why did you say it like that? Oh, okay, yeah. I think when I read it, I was, like, confused, but I see now. Uh, yeah, he, he's, like, regretting that in the future he won't even be there. See? Mm-hmm. His imminent disappearance. And at the end, when the um, when it's becoming more clear that uh, this is basically an AU of fetuses. Um, <laughs> Fetus AU, okay. <laughs> it's true. That's a good way. I mean, all right, you blow my mind right now. a better phrase, I guess. <laughs> the fetus AU. 
The fee to say you. <laughs> no, for your next for your next fanfic audience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> take take notes no, for no. your taglines that you should have on your professional copy right here. <laughs> Go to AO3. Go to the fee to say you tag. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um when that starts becoming more clear. The uh, the hospital that all the mothers are in, like, it's facing an emergency. It's on fire. And meanwhile, in the world of the dreams, well, not even the world of the dreams, the where all the students are all awake, there's a fire going on in the school. So that's how it's, it starts to meld together, that there's this common event happening. That ties yeah, And they all are together. stuck in the school forever, yeah. Yes and no, I guess. Because Mashiro is, it's shown that he is still dreaming even as the school is on fire. Yeah, because he's being born. He's having a rough birth. Yeah. Because nothing can be chill in this manga. <laughs> no, exactly. And in, the, in this hospital where all these mothers are, like, they're on their hospital beds and the building's on fire. Uh, the one implied to be Mashido's mother, she falls out of her bed. Oh, and she before that, she is told that she's about to have twins. Yeah. She's about to have a baby boy and a baby girl. And she falls out of her bed when, uh, uh, when this emergency is happening. And at this very same time, Mashido in the dream world is graduating. He found the key. He opened the door, and he is on his way to his next plane of existence, where his body just like he sees a what looks like just a black circle, and he falls in, and his body falls apart. Uh, this this manga definitely has something to say about um how life is a constant constant battle, apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it sure does. And how it's bent on tearing you apart. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, in a literal sense here. Yeah. Yes. Figurative, Very much literal. So. <laughs> yeah. And in this new life that Mashido faces, Mashido is a girl. And even says that she was originally she was supposed to have a brother, but he died in childbirth. Yes, which I think leads to another big uh, discussion point, Yeah, which is that like uh, last time in particular, we had talked about Mashiro being intersex and mm-hmm. being intersex um, representation. And I guess I was like, wait a minute, but if if Mashiro actually was shown in the end to be two separate beings... And mm-hmm. the Mashiro that we knew had to kill, like, one of those possibilities, those fates, literally another person. I'm just like, again, I have many questions. Because, yeah. first of all, we were never shown that Mashiro is, like, literally two separate beings, right? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. uh, so where was this? Does that mean the brother who died was just never a possibility? I guess I'm not I'm not um caught up like I I've fallen out of touch with my science so I can't remember like when twins start really developing like into separate beings so was it at the beginning of the manga Mashiro and his, uh, her brother were the the same and then throughout the manga they start splitting like I I was just like this doesn't seem to hold up uh like st- structure wise yeah yeah mm. It does make me wonder if Mizushiro, the art, the manga artist, if she had the ending planned from the start. I definitely feel like she must have had this one like pretty, pretty planned out. Because I mean, I think it's also uh, you know it's ten volumes, which apparently is, a, you know, like ten ten months is about actually the gestation period of hmm. humans. So, oh. uh. Yeah, so I was like, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure the 10 volumes was, like, on purpose, right? Like, yeah, like almost each volume is one month. And then, yeah, you know, be, being born. Huh. Yeah. Interesting theory. 
an interesting theory. Yeah, I have no proof of anything that I say. <laughs> Y'all, nothing nothing that I say is the word of God, okay? <laughs> so let's be clear. But that's definitely how I felt. And then, I mean, it, it was interesting reading her um, side notes because she definitely was like, oh, it got marketed as, uh, you know, a horror manga. So mm-hmm. she was like, I had to rearrange. Like, she definitely talks about rearranging some of the character beats that she had within the story right. but i never got the sense that she didn't know what they were you know <laughs> uh mm-hmm. yeah uh, which made me believe that she had it like pretty pretty down before she you know got too far too too far in the manga itself yeah right yeah at the very start of the series um uh, Mashino has this first period like like his first literal menstrual period yeah um like this takes place in a school. I don't mean like his first like class. I know and literally he starts bleeding. Ugh. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm like, okay, is that part of the they're breaking apart? Is that part of his brother already like not being a possibility, or her brother not being a possibility? I think that might be the case. Yeah. And throughout the manga, because toward the end, like around volume five or six. Um, Mashiro does start referring to himself in more feminine ways. Like, yeah, yeah, de- yeah. He does say, like, I'm a horrible girl. Oh, <laughs> Mashiro definitely gets, uh, yeah, increasingly feminine, which again, I think is very funny because then. Well, like when I first started reading this manga, I, I, I said on the last podcast, when I, when I looked at the covers, I thought Mashiro was a girl. But then, you know, you read the story and he insists that he is masculine. So I'm like, okay. So I, I read him as masculine. And then, yeah, the switch that you have to do, I was like, oh, this is this is very hard. And I, I think that's very, uh, to, to use a basic word, realistic of uh, mm-hmm. what does happen when, you know, uh, somebody transitions. It's, it's, it's not that most people around, like, uh, of course, some people probably are, you know, like, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to change Uh, pronouns for you and xyz but like people who knew you for a while it's just really hard for them to get out of the habit because their brain is just Mm -hmm. so used to it right like uh, so so they misgender you and all these things but they're not they don't they're not intentionally being uh, malicious right like Mm -hmm. uh, so i'm like i'm not intentionally being malicious to mashiro it's just really hard actually after yeah going through five or six volumes being like oh yeah he's he's a dude to be like oh just kidding uh you know (laughs) or like uh new information uh, I don't. I don't want to make oh. it a joke. Uh, yeah, just just new new information. Uh, Mashiro actually prefers to be female, and I'm like, it's just it's just hard because I'm like, that's what I assumed at first, and now it's now it's hard for me to go back. <laughs> it's really interesting because when I first got into After School Nightmare, I immediately assumed Mashiro was masculine, and I think part of that is because I'm really used to uh, to media related to Bishonen characters, mm. like. I just kind of saw Mashiro as like a really soft guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it fits. I think when I first looked at Mashiro, yeah, I just assumed female. And like, kind of my first big anime was um, The Vision of Escaflone, and the main character of that, Hitomi has short mm-hmm. hair too so i wasn't like thrown like i was like oh the hair doesn't uh throw me throw me off right like it, it doesn't matter <laughs> that mashiro's hair is short in any way hmm I don't know. Yeah, so this, this manga is very hard. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have questions. I have so many questions. Oh, and even so appears in the last uh, in the last page, like a reborn so. I um, know. <laughs> and what's interesting about that? He is, became a Megane though. Yeah, he is a Megane. <laughs> He's got the glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And. Something interesting about that is that you don't see a reborn Kudeha. And I thought, oh, I Ooh. wish I could have seen like all three of them in one panel. That would have been cool. Well, oh, I mean, like, they try, it tried to figure you out that they all died. True. Because the building's on fire and they were like on the top, the moms were on the top floor. And by the time the firefighters got there, it was pretty bad. And uh, yeah, in the dream school world, like Kreha, So, and the other two schmucks that I can't remember their names, <laughs> the parasite and the copycat uh, dude. Yeah, the copycat dude kind of came by surprise, at least to me, because it's like, 
wait, who are, who are you again? Who are you Were again? you even here before? I don't remember <laughs> you. Apparently. Apparently they were both there before and we're like, sure, why not? Um, if you say so. They might have been retconned in. No, well, I mean, I'd have to reread it again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's another thing worth rereading. Like, there are a couple of things where I'm like, wait, when was that mentioned? Did I? You're miss like, are something? you adding them back into panels that they weren't there for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm like, wait a sec. Wait a minute. Yeah. I mean, that's fair. Um, but yeah, so they were shown all like praying that Mashiro would be born. And so, yeah, my implication was that, you're, yeah, you're supposed to believe they're all dead, right? But then So shows up and you're like, oh, my God, yes. Uh, so so maybe Kareha is alive, but I, I was like, you know what? It might actually be okay if she's dead. Huh. I mean, I'd be sad because actually Kareha is the best character. Um, nice. <laughs> just just for real. Yeah, So's an asshole. I'm not going to lie. It's not so. I mean, I definitely started to like so more, like, you know, when he started to become friends with Kureha. Yeah. But I'm just like, uh, it's just so hard to like him. <laughs> he did show a more sensitive a side of himself when he did start to befriend Kureha. And I thought that was really interesting. Like, he was showing this genuine concern for her. Yeah, and I think that they just have, a, like, a funnier dynamic than, like, a, Ma- Mashiro has, like, a stick up their butt a mm-hmm. lot of the time. And yeah, everybody's like, Mashiro keeps trying to play a prince or is it a princess? You know what? We don't care. The point is he doesn't like, he's not, uh, yeah, you know, paying attention to people for the other person's sake. Uh, Mash- Mashiro is just doing it to uh, reassure uh, his own I- identity <laughs> at any mm-hmm. given moment and stuff. Yeah, so so like I feel like anybody plus Mashiro is annoying, and like Kuriha I think has a more abrasive personality, but like it's refreshing because she's just like, "Get out of here! You're so dumb, copycat boy! I'm gonna stab you!" And like, uh, okay, yeah, so she gets much more assertive later. Yeah, yeah, like uh, uh Kuriha obviously was uh, very girly and shy in the beginning, but then by the end she's like, "I am a badass, and I know it." <laughs> Like, mm-hmm, yes, girl, exactly. <laughs> get it. <laughs> and she doesn't absolutely, like, recoil at the sight of men anymore. Yeah, she's just like, okay, so, yeah, just like, so so and her have very funny uh, stuff together. Mm-hmm. I also was like, is this Black Rose uh, p- play thing that they wanted to put on? I understand that none of the plot seemed like anything from Utna, but I was like, is this a reference to Utna? <laughs> That's a good uh, question. In the but... Black Rose arc. <laughs> Oh my god. Huh. But then like made it even sillier being like, there are 12 vampire boys wow. <laughs> after the Black Rose Princess's heart. And I was like, okay. <laughs> this is <Amazing>. very 2005. <laughs> oh, definitely. And like, I think part of uh, something that was starting to illustrate was they were starting to reach a point where they were happy. Right? Just like chill happiness. They didn't stay there for very long. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. They didn't stay there long. And they were reaching a point of peace. And I think that was that was a sign that, that, that they were ready to graduate. Yeah. Well, it was fun to pick up on the like, uh, oh, yeah, well... Uh, why Why do we even, as the audience, like, we know when they're going to graduate. They see a, a a hole opening up in the sky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mm-hmm. know? <laughs> it's a little bittersweet there. And then the fire happens. It's like, oh, it's not bittersweet anymore. And now it's just heart-wrenching. It's just anxious making. Exactly. Yeah, I'm just like, man, did you need this fire thing? You had everything. You had so much already. Right. And I'm thinking, like, with the overall themes of the story, especially with gender and physical sex be- and sexuality being a huge part of it, I thought, what was the story trying to say about gender or sex? Was it trying to say anything at all? And was it a mind screw for shock value? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, regardless of whether it was a mind screw for shock value, um, people are going to take away that it has stuff to say about gender. And I think that 
uh, you know, uh, yeah, in, in my Discord, there was somebody who was like, I would never recommend a trans person read this manga. Uh, oh, okay. because a- as the last time we had talked more about like yeah the gender like essentialism that happens mm-hmm. in this manga but i really think I-, I would never say that and i think it depends on what type of story you uh like like you know like a yeah uh i actually usually prefer dark stories i have uh-huh. come around more to um I can tell the evolution in myself because I'm like, oh, yes, these happy stories. Wow, they're amazing. <laughs> you know, like Steven Universe and she and stuff. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Happy yeah. people being happy sometimes. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. my, my biggest uh, confusion is that I'm like, I like, since we mentioned Bleach earlier, I'm like, I like Orihime? Huh. Question mark? Weird. <laughs> Interesting. You have to reread Bleach now. <laughs> But yeah, so I'm just like, uh, yeah, if you like to, like, After School Nightmare is not afraid to go anywhere, right? And, like, I think that that actually is still valuable in a story to just be like, uh, I don't know that, you know, it has all the right answers or conclusions or anything, but, like, it's just not afraid to be like, I don't know, I'm going to bring it up and uh, do some something uh, dark and twisted and... Uh, shrug <laughs> you know like, like if, if you like dark and twisted stuff like absolutely read after school nightmare if you like dark and twisted stuff and you're interested in uh gender discussions yeah like read after school nightmare you know <laughs> like i'm glad that you brought up the fact that um you said that in your discord that someone said that they wouldn't recommend after school nightmare to a trans reader yeah earlier on when i agreed to uh, to do this podcast with you I actually did wonder to myself, like, I wonder if it would be better off if someone who were trans were to uh, go on this podcast to talk about it, because I was wondering, maybe I'm not quite qualified enough to talk on certain issues, Mm. other than just, like, what I know. Yeah. Because I'm not trans or intersex, so I can't say I know exactly how a lot of these things feel. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely fair. Uh, I would feel like, yeah, the issue with this one is that, like, the twist isn't until the end, right? So, like, you read it and you don't even know. Like, yeah, you assume intersex. And then right. it, I feel like it does kind of transform, uh, you know, into a trans story, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm like, okay, that, that sure is a thing that happened. Yeah, and I mean, you get you get all the normal, like, transformation things except for the hair cutting i guess <laughs> type of deal actually uh or like any transformation of hair but yeah uh mashiro mm-hmm. uh is always waffling between whether to wear a boy's or a girl's uniform which i'm trying to think now because um yeah my, my my romantic partner is trans and i think it's very funny because he went to you know like private school growing up so like in america compared to japan like uniforms aren't as big of a thing <laughs> um but mm. uh yeah my, my trans partner actually did have to you know grow up with uniforms and like yeah it was a big deal in high school and he was like mm. i am not you know wearing the female uniform <laughs> anymore mm. um so I think it's actually very uh, powerful for it to be a, a school setting in After School Nightmare in, in Japan and these things. But yeah, in general, I'm just like, yeah, uh, it's very hard to be like, make somebody who hasn't already read this story, uh, who is trans, be like, hey, yeah, r- read this manga because you're like, oh, man, it's just so <laughs> it's it's exactly. just a lot, right? Like you can't, uh, can't, can't really ask that of somebody for sure. They have yeah, to be intrigued exactly. themselves. And something that we mentioned earlier was sort of that intersection between between shoujo manga and boys love manga. Because mm. in the end, Mashiro mostly gets with So. Yeah. Oh, that actually is very funny because, um, yeah, my partner was reading kind of the last volume with me in bed earlier. Like I was reading it because I had to read it for this podcast and he was just like, I don't have anything to do while I'm like cuddling next to you. So I'm going to read this final volume, which this thing is very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and at one point he was like, okay. He's like, this is fine because it's gay. And I was like, well, no, <laughs> because Mashiro currently actually identifies as female, even though they're currently wearing the guy's uniform in this 
scene and it was like oh god <laughs> it's, it's so complicated mm-hmm. Ugh. yeah i thought that was really interesting because okay i did look into what other manga ran in the magazine uh hmm. that after school nightmare ran in so after school nightmare ran in princess magazine which is an akita shoten publication so if anyone is as interested in, as I am in defunct manga publications, <laughs> um, well, Princess is still ongoing, but the English uh, licensor for After School Nightmare is defunct. Yeah. And in addition, another manga that's run in Princess Magazine is From Eroica with Love, which mm. is one of my favorites. It's been running since like the 70s. And... That was licensed by CMX Comics, which was a manga uh, licensor that went defunct in 2010. If you ever read mm. from Eroica with Love, please let me know. I need to talk to someone about it. I've only read okay. the first volume, but it is by far one of my favorite manga. <laughs> <laughs> but I bring up that particular manga because it's considered like a boys love staple. My understanding is that back in the day, like... Uh, yeah, you, you said it's from the 70s, right? Mm-hmm. It started in the 70s. Yeah, my understanding from what I've learned just doing this podcast, so I haven't I haven't read a lot of like scholarship about anything, um, mm-hmm. but from people who have come on this podcast and did do more of that scholarship, my understanding is that Boys Love and Shoujo actually weren't as separated. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. D- historically, right? And and But mm-hmm. now the bifurcation is, is much stronger. Yeah, yeah. Earlier on, with uh, in the boys' love genre, boys' love ran in shoujo magazines like Kaze Tokino Uta, um, Song of the Wind and Trees. I don't remember which magazine it ran in when it debuted, but it was definitely in a um, shoujo magazine. Yeah, I mean, to me, again, the the bifurcation confuses me mildly because, like. They're words that describe different things, right? And like one isn't exclusive of the other because shoujo is just targeted at younger girls, basically. Mm-hmm. Like that, that's all it really means. Yeah. And then boys love is just a description of the like gender slash sex of the romance that's going to happen. Right. And so I'm like, those aren't mutually exclusive things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know that there's a really, um, a term that I was, introduced to kind of recently called Jose Muke. And the, the, the way it was described to me was basically as an umbrella term for things like boys love, shoujo, jose, and otome media. Hmm. But there's even within that, there's like some overlap because Jose Muke is like, this is aimed at, pe- at, at like women and girls. Like, for the most part, like there can be overlap with other things, but for the most part, it's aimed at women and girls. So things like, like a lot of the mobile games that are popular these th- days, like Obey Me, if, if you've heard of that one, um, or A3. Have you heard of either of those? Uh, I'm not, because I am very bad at keeping up with the Otomes. Oh, that's fine. Obey Me is a really popular one these days. If you like demons, you'll like it. Um, <laughs> I see. Sexy demons. Okay. <laughs> that's the big appeal of it. But yeah, like a lot of these uh, a media like this, like is supposed to be aimed towards women in general, uh, regardless of the gender of the characters involved. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. Yeah. I guess I've also always been confused about, like, uh, I don't want to exclude, I'm just, like, Yaoi. I'm also confused about it for Yuri, too. Um, I'm like, Yuri's Yuri is not... a very interesting case. Like, there's always been, every now and then, uh, discourse related to who Yuri is made for. It's, and the, I think lately the consensus has been, like, it's for anyone and everyone. It's fine. Yeah, but I guess, you know, I can see why, you know, if Yaoi is, is presumed to be for women, 
I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, in some ways, yeah, it makes sense that Yuri is for men, but I'm just like, I just don't feel like these things have to be true. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, and there's a lot more overlap and intermingling these days, especially now, because like queer identities are, are starting to gain more uh, of a, uh, a visibility in Japanese media, I notice. Like, I don't know if you're aware about um, the creator of Fushigi Yugi, Yu Watase, they came out as non-binary in recent years. Yeah, yeah. I, I have talked about that recently. I've been like, oh my goodness, it all makes yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember reading some kind of interview ages ago, even before Yu Watase came out as non-binary. Uh, they had said like, oh yeah, I hate tropes in shoujo manga. And I thought at the time, like, wait, why are you still making shoujo manga if you hate them? Yeah, I was, I was always like, Yu Watase hates... Uh... Uh, gender stereotypes, I think, basically, like yeah. Uh, when you when Watase went to write a sh- uh, you know shonen series, it was still like pretty shoujo y And I was like, Watase mm-hmm. wants to exist somewhere in the middle, yeah. <laughs> Just like, Good for them, yeah, yeah. No, I I agree. So I I hope yeah this bifurcation um does become less strong. Hmm going on and again i think that's that is one of the actual appeals of after school nightmare is that after school nightmare uh feels like it just doesn't care about any conventions (laughs) so it just does does whatever right like i would say it does and it doesn't because it does play around and sort of breaks some, uh, some of those expectations but it sort of relies on a uh on the idea that the audience knows about these stereotypes and might believe some of them. Oh, well, well yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's always like uh, you have to know the thing before you can, uh, yeah, just go crazy, subvert it, which mm-hmm. is why I always, I always get, this is a silly example, but yeah, I'm always like, Kill a Kill is one of my favorite anime, and I'm like, I can't recommend it to anybody who hasn't watched, like, you know, anime before, because oh, you just don't get, get you don't get anything <laughs> that's happening in it, yeah. <laughs> and the fan service might be a little off-putting to people who are new. Yeah, exactly, so I'm just like, no, you, you don't appreciate this series, Unless you've animated, like, a significant amount. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like, being aware of certain tropes and then seeing how they're broken. Yeah. Uh, But I still think, like, uh, again, I'm I'm always, like, I don't ever want to be essentialist about stories either. Like, I still think that uh, After School Nightmare, uh, for people who are maybe questioning and like dark stories, is actually, like, somewhat helpful. Mm Mm-hmm. Good point could be interesting to help you explore and think about different things yeah yeah shouldn't be used as a like guidebook or anything no no (laughs) no absolutely not (laughs) no yeah i guess i just wanted to read uh one of the listeners replied being like i love this series so much so i I replied back being like oh yeah what what do you love about it um the handle is appazar5011 on twitter Um, they 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 replied uh they love the dark themes uh like finding yourself who to trust love triangles always gotta love a good love triangle oh absolutely (laughs) beautiful art um the the plot twists and turns like so many things that they love and then they they, then they followed up with oh and hot characters (laughs) and i was like like, you can never forget hot characters absolutely most important (laughs) Yeah, so I think we've we've gone through a lot of the uh, big themes and stuff. So if you're comfortable, we we can circle back around to any uh, thoughts that come up later. But we should do, I guess, some form of shipping corner. <laughs> oh, I ships, have an answer for this. Ships happened. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so no. um, actually, for a hot second, I'm gonna try to list them in order of like concreteness that they like are you know like yeah. like a uh, reality within the crazy non-reality of the series <laughs> um mm-hmm. so for a hot second f- from from least reality to most reality okay so for a hot second kurosaki <laughs> and mashiro were like a thing maybe <laughs> yeah i thought that had a lot of potential i i hope that they would take that a few steps further but they didn't i'm like ah darn darn um 
yeah, I feel like that might have helped me care about Kurosaki more. <laughs> yeah, that's honestly. Because mm-hmm. um, I, I just feel like, like I get, I get it intellectually, you know, like um, yeah. Kurosaki was this nice guy and he's pretty good looking, like, and the point is that he has this like hard turn and like suddenly he's not such a nice guy and he's like frustrated and just like letting it all out on people and all mm-hmm. these things. And so I'm just like, I get it, but yeah, I wanted him to have like a nice soft moment with Mashiro, maybe, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that would have helped me like care before his hard turn more. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Kurosaki, you got shortchanged by this uh, story, is how I feel. Sorry, bro. Sorry, bro. Uh, go fight Kuchiki Biyuki now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then, then for a hot second, we had So and Kureha, which I'm not gonna lie, I was kind of into. <laughs> oh, same. Yeah, like, oh, and the uh, the part where um, So suddenly kisses Kureha when they see Mashiro, and they do it just to make him mad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you just guys are so him. bad. You guys are so good at being bad. <laughs> exactly. And it was Kureha's idea. Yeah, it was it was kind of like a strange delight to see them together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, someone's salty. Both of you are. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's 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 get together for our, for our, for for the sake of upsetting our common enemy. Oh, I love this dynamic. I love it. I know. And as I said before, they also are like, uh, they're like the funniest together because you mm-hmm. know. Uh, so will be like I, what? What was the, there was one panel that I flagged. I guess I could look it up on my phone really quickly. Oh, I guess it wasn't actually him talking to Kureha. He was talking to Mashiro, but you know, so uh, I guess Mashiro was saying something about you know be being jealous uh, that he was with Kureha for a second, and mm-hmm. he's like, I get it. You know, Kureha is better than me. She's cuter and all these things, and so is like, I don't think you guys are comparable and so his thought bubbles are uh, Fujishima's like a hot tempered squirrel sometimes she throws walnuts at me <laughs> and it's just a picture of Kureha as a squirrel and then uh, so getting hit with a walnut saying ouch all cu- how cute <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and then he's like Ichijo is like a penguin I guess tall and resolute as he stares ahead I wonder what he's looking at the cute little thing. <laughs> it's like, what? This is the inside of so slots. They're like, they're just, it's so silly. <laughs> it's so, uh, just delightful. Just Absolutely. But in the end, um, Magane, So, and female Machiro apparently are a real couple. Well, also, M- M- Dream Machiro and So were also a real couple. So how does that make you feel? <laughs> Wait, was um at the very end for Mashiro and So? I thought they they didn't really go into like Oh that's true. They weren't they didn't know each other. Yeah. That's the I implication. Come on. <laughs> yeah, like they they kind of left you hanging, like they get on the same train on different doors, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like will they ever talk again? Will they ever meet again? Who knows? The story's <laughs> over some your name level nonsense right here. but as for shipping honestly i have an ot3 it is so kureha and mashiro mashiro in the middle i mean it makes sense i mean yep. i'm the ot3 camp here yeah i mean the answer to love triangles again is always why not both exactly and it's very strong in this one mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Very, very. And it's just an inherently queer kind of situation. And I adore that. Yeah, in both ways. Exactly. <laughs> all, all sides, yeah. They can all love each other together. Polyamory. Hell yeah. We support it. <laughs> Even though I super would be like, oh my God, having one partner is hard enough. No, I can't have another one. You know, like personally, I'm like, oh God, no. <laughs> Just like, absolutely not. <laughs> there was this one, um, I was about to say Vine, but Vine is dead. Um, this one TikTok, I guess, 
Yeah. Um, that was, I think it was tagged under, this is what polyamory is like, or this is what ethical non-monogamy is like. And it was a triad, so three people. And two of them were like, I like being polyamory because my partner gets to do my hair. And the other one who was doing <laughs> the hair was like, I love... I love her. I get to do her hair. And then the third partner was out like doing home improvement work on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was like so in like Kudaha and um and Mashiro like doing each other's hair and so is like out on the deck. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> Yep. I mean again, yeah. Imagine what you could accomplish, yeah, with three people. Exactly. Three adults in your household. I mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much, so much possibility. You know? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I think that covers you know the basics of after school nightmare. Because again, as we said, you could write a kajillion papers just about each, uh, you know, dream manifestation of each person. Absolutely. Or make an OC. Yeah, yeah, oh God. Just like a whole AU of this. Yeah. You could write a whole damn book that's probably longer than After School Nightmare, analyzing After School Nightmare. Like, it's that type of manga, you know? So I, I'm not the podcast that's going to go into each chapter by chapter. That's not this podcast. This is just a podcast where we talk about it and you are like, hard agree, or like, no, I disagree so much, you know, about everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, do you have any final thoughts about this? I did actually want to address, yeah, reading it for a second time. How did it like change anything for you? Just like clearly? Oh, man. I'm surprised it didn't like it left an impression on me the first go around. Mm. But on the second read, uh, uh, reading, it's like, why did it leave a bigger impression? <laughs> some of these yeah. twists, like, like for some of them, it's like, how did I not remember that? How did I not remember that they were all basically fetuses? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Like, how did I forget some of these things? These are very important. Yeah, what what twist did you remember? I remembered the fact that um, Mashiro was reborn as a girl at the mm. very end that I remembered. For some reason, the the last couple of panels really stood out in my mind. Mm. And the fact that it left it was left really ambiguous, I remembered that. Um, the fact that I, So's sister, was a figment of his, his imagination. I don't know how I forgot that. <laughs> I thought, no, no, that's no, 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 big that's one. big. How could I I think not that's the one that's going to that? stick with me the most, <laughs> you know? Yeah, same, same. Like, so this was all in your head, my dude. Yeah, it's weird. This is like your comfortable imaginary friend who went awry. Oh, yeah, that I think I did want to. Yeah, I was like, this is uh, some extreme take on imaginary friends right here. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I did think it was interesting that overall the manga, uh, you know, like does address some very big things that in childhood could distress you and you, yeah, you don't have the, uh, you know, like, full capacity to process them or uh you know you know handle them even um right. but i was like oh man imaginary friends just got hella weird in this manga <laughs> <laughs> way way more sexual than i wanted it to be just like all around like that's definitely the most extreme thing that's why i'm like it's gonna live with me forever <laughs> oh yeah and you said you hadn't read this until i mentioned it right oh yeah yeah this is this is my first go through that's why i'm like oh Wow. <laughs> I was not prepared. Yeah. <laughs> I was not prepared. <laughs> uh, so I feel like, yeah, it's one of those manga where I'm like, okay, I got to read it again in like, yeah, mm -hmm. 10, year, 10 years or something and uh, I see yeah. how I feel about it. <laughs> Only the third go around at this, maybe, knowing what I know now. Like, okay, what did I miss? What makes more sense now? Yeah, what makes more sense? What makes less sense? Like, what, mm -hmm. I think it goes both ways here, yep. And I'll have to see if I can find... Uh, oh, are you familiar with the site, the TV Tropes Wiki? 
Yeah. I remember years and years ago when I was in high school reading this, I went on the TV Tropes Wiki to see what they had to say about this manga. And I think this was before more people my age were starting to be more aware of queer issues. Mm. Because some people were, uh, were saying like, oh, it's impossible to have both masculine and feminine anatomy. And I'm thinking now, like, no, it is possible. Yeah. Being intersex is totally a thing. Possible. Yeah, yeah, totally possible. So I kind of wonder if I were to go back there, um, maybe things have changed. Maybe people will have whole new speculations about this story. <laughs> I know, that's true. I, I, that's, what, that's why I feel like I'm like, this story is a story that uh, evolves with time, I feel, you know? Yeah. Good point. Um, so, you know, uh, everybody, we, we're all going to have to keep rereading this manga. That's basically the conclusion of this podcast. Yep. <laughs> um, and I definitely expect, uh, anybody who has read it to come and, uh, hard agree and disagree with something that we said in this podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so please, please tell me anyway. Uh, I will tell you how to tell me now. <laughs> Thanks for listening <laughs> to Shoujo and Tell. <laughs> Comments, questions, constructive criticism, concerns. Need to gush about your OTP or OT3? Uh, <laughs> email Shoujo and Tell at gmail.com or leave a comment on the episode's YouTube page. We're at Shoujo and Tell on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Uh, Muno, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Yeah, so on Facebook and Twitter, you can find me at Moon Tunes Art. Moon spelled M O O N, like the celestial body in the sky. Tunes spelled T O O N S, like cartoons. And art spelled exactly how you think. Instagram, I am Moontunes, and Tumblr, I am at Moon-Tunes. Um, you can find my art, my comics, uh, my Patreon, all that good stuff, and it's October. I'm currently participating in Blacktober. Take a look at some of my artworks and see if you can find your faves. Um, talk, to me, talk to me about Hypnosis Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, again, I do love Moon Tunes. That is very good. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you excited every time you see a new episode from us? If so, please consider leaving a rating on Apple Podcasts. This will help the show reach more hearts, or at least ears. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next time for some shoujo or a jose. I don't know. Okay, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> Stay tuned to find out. Until then, bye. Bye.